to Art Online. My uh, guest today is um, is coming all the way from East Sussex. It's uh, Matthew Burroughs, and, and you look like you're in your studio there, Matthew. How are you doing? I, I am, yes, yeah. In Studio One, there's, there's another built, there's another studio next door. So I use this one for actually I use this one mainly for drawing. Although there's lots of paintings in here today. Yeah, and no, the one next door is for painting and sculpture. It's looking pretty, pretty full. Uh, you gave me a bit of a sneak preview out your window earlier as well. It looks like you're in a nice part of the country as well. Yes, yeah, so I sort of my studio sits on the sites of where there used to be a windmill. So it's it's kind of high up on a ridge between two valleys. So I overlook Tillingham Valley, which is sort of runs into Long Tillingham River into Rye in East Sussex. Oh, so it's a lovely part of the world. One of the, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, Matthew, very specifically, because obviously we, we're coming out of lockdown now, but but just as at the time that we were going into lockdown, it was quite, an, and it still is, but it was, it was a really nervy time for a lot of artists. And, uh, and one of the things that you came up with that seems to have really taken on um, is the artist support pledge. Uh, so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about that and, and what gave you the idea, first of all, what, to, 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 to come up with that and to, to, to release it. Uh, well, I was literally just sort of sitting around on the morning of the 16th of March. I'd actually just been doing some emails and I'd had to cancel some forthcoming projects that I hadn't kind of fully committed to, but I was, you know, every, everything was kind of slowly collapsing around them. And I was thinking, they're not going to happen. Uh, I was also kind of thinking, okay, I've been working towards an exhibition. I didn't think that was going to happen. And at the same time, I was getting some messages coming up on my phone and on my um, laptop from friends and colleagues just saying, you know, exhibition cancelled. And it just seemed every other message on social media or on my emails was, you know, exhibition closing, cancelled, losing work, not going to work tomorrow. And I sort of sat there thinking that this is really desperate. I mean, I, you know, I knew that artists are always vulnerable anyway, you know, the best of times. You know, many artists live on the edge of their overdrafts and they work in gig economy. So they're not, um, they're always on that kind of edge of the vulnerable side of the economy. And I thought, okay, they're talking about three months, a three month gap in income. That's a long time for artists to go with no income at all and probably no support from government or anyone else because artists never do. And we always, you know, kind of slip through the gaps of those sorts of support. And then I thought, well, OK, three months, but it will be at least six because after those three months, it's going to take ages before everything starts moving again, if it does at all. So that's a six month period with no income. I mean, I was kind of worried. I was sitting there thinking, well, that's not good. You know, that's really, you know, not a good situation to be in. And I knew lots of people who that was going to cripple. Um, so I, li I, I literally just kind of sat there and in a moment of desperation thought, right, I've got to do something and I've got to do something radical. And I've got to do it now, not tomorrow, not next week, or I can't spend the week thinking about it. It's got to be done today. So I wrote down, I literally wrote on a piece of paper, assets. And I tried to write my assets down. <laughs> I only got two, but they seem to have worked. <laughs> and one was artwork, because I thought, okay, I've got lots of that and artists have a lot of that. And the other one was this culture, trust and generosity. And it's something I've been sort of working with for about 12 years now as um, I came up with a project which is, is called our support projects, formerly called ABC projects, which um, is basically kind of a mentoring, kind of peer mentoring scheme for artists, sort of mid-career and sort of established artists who just need kind of support structures or kind of more in-depth critique and um, around their work as they go forward and work, you know, professionally as artists. And it works in sort of small groups of kind of four or five people at a time. And I do this for two days every, probably six times a year tops. And I've been doing this for 12 years. And one of the things I've noticed over that time, one of the sort of ideas that I developed was that if you create an environment where, and a kind of critical forum, where trust and generosity are central to its ethos, it's substantially more productive than if you have the kind of environment that's about uh, sort of competitiveness or um, kind of sounding, being right or getting one up on everybody else. That never produces good, really so sound kind of advice and kind of knowledge sharing. And this has been really 
kind of successful in its own small way, you know, and I had never really thought of it as being a kind of big project. It was always sort of something I just did. And then every now and again, we'd reel out something like a bigger project. So we did, um, you know, with the groups and, that I work with, I did um, the Observer Building Hastings a few years ago in 2014, which was a big kind of exhibition space um, in an old newspaper factory. We ran that for a year and a half. So we kind of do interventions like that. But really, it's just about supporting artists who, many of whom are very established, but they just need that kind of sort of emotional and intellectual support structure in depth around them. So I had already had this kind of network of people who had bought into this idea that generosity matters. Uh, and I just kind of just played with that. I went along with it for the day. I sort of mucked around with this idea that, okay, if you've got the product, artwork, and you've got this culture, generosity, how do I find a way of making that generate an economy? And so I, I, I literally kind of played with this idea of an economy and I, I drew drawings of what I thought economies looked like. Um, and I mean, interestingly, the drawing I drew of our economy, which is the one we've worked, we work under in, in the kind of developed world is a kind of pyramid. So at the top of the pyramid is a point. There aren't many people on the top of that pit point. But there are many people at the base of the pyramid. And the higher the point goes, the higher it goes up, the, the richer the people get at that point, the greater the base at the base of the pyramid, the more people need to be there to sustain that point. Mm. So that's a sort of analogy for our own economy. It makes some people super wealthy and it makes a lot of people subservient to that wealth. It's also a very slow economy. It, it doesn't move money around very rapidly. It tends to hold money in pockets. And so when people, when, when you get money, it's protected. That's the nature of the beast. That's how, that's why it was started the agrarian industrialization to protect assets. I didn't want that kind of economy. I didn't want an economy that protected assets. I wanted an economy that shared assets. So I thought, okay, we can't have a pyramid economy. We've got to have an economy that lowers that level. So I came up with this idea of small little pyramids next to one another. So it's like look, it's a zigzaggy line. And so there's lots of points. So there are many more people on top of the, who can make it to that level, but it's still a kind of zigzaggy line. You know, there's still people on top and people at the bottom. And in effect, I think that's kind of what I, you know, what I've sort of generated with our support page, because I lowered that ceiling to 200 pounds. No one can earn more than 200 pounds per post. So that meant that it leveled the playing field. No one could sort of, no artist could go on it and pretend to be more valuable or more worthy than anyone else, even if they were more successful already or well-established and their prices were high. They had to muck in with everyone else. And actually that was a kind of part of that generosity. It's just everyone mucking in together. I, I like the way that you've described the um, little, little pyramids on that. So what I'm thinking of now is because the artist support pledge, just to reiterate, if you, you sell an artwork for 200 pounds and then when you get to a thousand pounds worth of sales, so potentially a minimum of five sales, yeah. you, you, you essentially take the top of that pyramid yeah. and, you, and you put it back into the economy to create a base or a building block for somebody else. Is that right? Because yeah. the That's idea right. is you get to a thousand pounds and then you buy somebody else's work for 200 pounds. Yeah, that's it. I mean, and what it, what it does in a way is it, it, it generates artists. What I, my, my theory for this was that artists will be naturally more supportive of their peers, whereas buyers will be naturally more conservative. So they will tend to buy the things they think they like and the rest of it. Whereas artists will, will look across their communities and support. So it creates this sort of double economy. It creates economy where you get buyers coming in and supporting the system by buying what they like. And you get the money then pushed across the communities as artists support their fellow artists and colleagues. So it stops this sort of situation where, you know, only certain very popular sorts of work get bought. So, it, I mean, it doesn't eliminate it, but it, it softens it and it pushes that money across the system. So that kind of, that 200 pound moves across it. And also, I like this idea that if it's a generous culture, there's got to be an act of generosity going into it. So you've got to post your work quite cheap. 
And I, I came up with a 200 pound figure because I thought that's so low from, for artists who are already, you know, doing this as a job like myself, that's well, well below my, my market value. So it's a real act of generosity to put the money on, to put anything on at that price. But also it, it includes virtually everyone. So anyone can put anything on under 200 pounds, whether it's even five pounds. So even a student could do it or a, anyone, it doesn't matter. Um, so there's a kind of act of generosity going into it. But I thought, actually, if it's just a selling platform, if it's just like a kind of art world, a cheap art world version of Amazon, or if it's like any other kind of selling platforms that do this, like Etsy or anything like that, then that doesn't really fit with the culture of it. And the culture of it has to be that it's a kind of egalitarian culture that shifts. It's about support across the community. So I thought there's got to be a kind of way out or, or a point where you then push the support back across the system. And that's why I came up with the idea of putting money back in. Uh, it was just about then deciding at what point you put it back in. And initially I thought, I thought 200 pounds in, 2000 pounds reached, 200 pounds back in. But then I realized that that wasn't enough. That wasn't painful enough to be generous. So I lowered it to the thousand pounds, which is 20%, which is quite a big return into the system. And I sort of, sort of I sat around thinking about it for the rest of the day, playing with it, and then just made the post in the evening of the 16th of March, um, explaining what I thought, you know, how it worked, put an image of mine on, and then the following day, I'd already reached the pledge, and I looked on the, on the hashtag, and there was two other people on it. So I bought their work, and um, I think by the evening, there were... Uh, I think by lunchtime that day, I was getting messages every second. So I knew it was gaining momentum. And then by the evening, I was getting two messages a second. And it went on like that nonstop for nearly a month, where it, I couldn't see, ever see my phone because it was just lit up continuously with messages. And then, and by that kind of, by the following day, I realized it was going viral. And, and I, I, I started really kind of going for it. So I, emailed friends in the art world, um, collectors, and just said, anyone, anyone could donate a thousand pounds to help me get this going and to keep it going, to do some awards and the rest of it. And immediately I got people giving me money. Um, and, and, I, and I started putting that red to our support pledge tile out in the world. And then that really took off when I did that. Um, and it just kind of went from there, just kept going. It's it's amazing how that has just happened. So so just so you the th the first thing is without any promise you just put out a post. That was it. You put out a post saying what your idea was, and then suddenly within the space of what the best part of a day, that seems to have caught on. Yeah, I mean it was within twenty four hours. Um, it was at two hundred and fifty posts. So that now seems. I, you know, I don't even think about that because now it, it's now at nearly quarter of a million. Wow. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about that, thinking I, I, each of these posts is worth, you know, 200 pounds, sometimes more. So one of my posts is worth 12,000 pounds because it's an addition. So some of these posts are substantially valuable. You know, some are up to 20,000 pounds per post, but some are only 20 pounds. So, you know, it varies. I like you're saying that one post, you're saying I've got an addition and it's 200 quid per yeah, the addition basically. Okay. So if they sell that all of that additions and people are, then that one post can be worth <laughs> uh, twenty thousand pounds. So even more than that actually, but that's that's kind of the top end of the average edition. So um, I realised quite quickly this was substantial, and within you know within twenty four hours I'd raised ten thousand pounds in donations to to support it. Um, I, and by that point I was working flat out to keep it going, and I was like that for best part of a month I, I did not stop it was 20 hours a day literally kind of didn't even stop to eat it was sort of ate the, the leftovers of what my son was cooking which was pizza <laughs> so I, I got his leftovers and he got to eat pizza for a month so he was quite happy I mean that that is absolutely remarkable to be honest with you I mean and and uh, an unbelievable and I think the, the one thing that that is resonating for me now hearing uh, a lot of what you said is this sort of really at the beginning you you had the concept of this culture of trust and generosity mm. because 
Because actually, if I'm thinking about it, the RT support pledge doesn't work without that. It, it, it doesn't have the same sort of resonance. If you can't trust you know, the artist that's selling to then say, actually, I am now going to give £200 to buy somebody else's work. If you don't believe in that system, then nobody can, can buy into it. Yeah. It seems that lots of people are believing in that system. They want it to work. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing that I, to be honest, I just didn't see that coming as in the success of it. When I, mean, I believed in it, that's why I do it. But it, I've been trying to do it for years and it's a hard sell, <laughs> largely, you know, because the art world is, you know, the art world as we know it is a very good example of, it manifests in all of its full glory all the worst points of what our civilization stands for, which is power for the few, um, you know, suppression of the many to sustain that power, inequality, which is endemic to the system. And we're seeing that across the world right now, you know, as it's reading its ugly head. This has been going on for thousands of years. This is not a new phenomenon. Our system has built this system. You know, uh, the way we operate as a culture is based its very foundation is based on inequality and that's why we have it and you can't just suddenly get rid of inequality by saying so you've got to do things differently mm -hmm. so in a way all i've actually done is just say okay if we just change our value system if we just say having gaining having power standing out being a celebrity being on top being the most successful financially is not the best thing but actually sustaining, supporting, sharing, being a community is the best thing. It's amazingly compelling. And actually all, all it's actually done is show that. It's just show that actually that human beings, I think, give them permission to do that. Give them permission just to say, you know what, it's all right to believe that. And, it's, and this is how to do it. You know, this is a way of doing it. This is, this is how it might look like. And this is an economy that might support it and it's just obviously taken off it's just you know fallen on the right ears at the right time i mean i think timing is definitely there's definitely something in it in terms of you know if you're trying it for a period of time and then then suddenly this happens so suddenly people's minds are open to trying something yeah. new something different um gosh so many things to ask you there's something about that level playing field which i think is important as well but do you think also um, by, by making art more accessible, by using the simple um, hashtag and, you know, the Instagram medium with everyone doing the same thing, it's actually become more accessible to, um, to collectors, not only collectors, but also people that might not have generally thought of themselves as art collectors in the first place. So actually perhaps bringing new people into the market because suddenly you're scrolling down a feed, you think, oh, I like that, I like that. I know I'm not gonna spend more than 200 quid because it's not in that big fancy gallery in Mayfair, but uh, let's, see, let's see if it's available. Do you think that's happening? Oh, I mean, without doubt that's happening. And I think the thing that within, within 24 hours of me starting this, I was getting messages from people saying, I've already sold this amount. And people had already made their pledge within 24 hours. So that's a thousand pounds in 24 hours. Well, 800 pounds minus their pledge. Mm -hmm. um, but then what started happening after about four or five days, I started getting the equal amount of messages from buyers. And it was, they just loved it. They loved the whole experience of it. They loved the culture. They loved the ethos. They loved the message of hope. Um, they bought in completely to the community. And, so the, and the sense that when they were buying an artist or maker's work. It wasn't just they were buying something. They were connecting to somebody because they were messing them personally. Yeah. They were finding out about them, their work, their lives. It was a kind of in, a connectedness to, you know, not only the, the objects they were buying, but also the makers who made them. And that's, that, that was really compelling to buyers. You know, and yes, there were collectors. I knew, you know, I know there are collectors that are buying on this. But actually what was really surprising was how many people who'd never bought art before were buying on it. My neighbors, you know, my friends of mine who've never bought an artwork were suddenly buying one, then buying two, and then saying, well, actually that one's only 50 pounds. Maybe I could have that one too. And before they know it, they're, you know, they're filling their house with art. 
and it's, it's quite yeah, compelling when you get into it. Yeah. I, I, I'm seeing the same thing. I'm seeing the same thing. I'm seeing different people entering, entering the market. And I think it's because it seems more accessible. And, uh, you know, people still love art because there's a lot of people going through this, this challenging, challenging time. You know, people being furloughed or losing jobs or things. It's awfully challenging to a whole bunch of folk in society. And, and yet it's still nice to be able to, to buy something for yourself, to get something nice, to be able to message personally an artist, to have a conversation, to get to know them. Mm. Yeah, and I think, I think there's also, I mean, there has been for a very long time, a sort of distrust of corporate society and a kind of a weariness of it, mm. but there's never really been a kind of accessible alternative that's been accessible to just everybody without being part of a very specific kind of community of some sort. So I think in a way, what's, what I think is kind of odd now, and, and I've spoken to an awful lot of people about this in the last few months, you know, all from economists to businessmen to philosophers to tech people and the rest of it. And so many people say to me, how did you come up with it? Like it was rocket science. Like I just invent, reinvented the wheel. And I look back now and I think, well, it, it just seemed very straightforward at the time. But now I look at it, I think it was a really elegant set of solutions, mm. not just because actually this, the economy of it is really simple, but the ethos of it matches the economy. But also I think the thing that really made it work was that the way social media works allowed that to transfer across communities really quickly. So if you'd done this without social media, it wouldn't work. If I'd done this with, without COVID-19, it wouldn't have worked because the co in effect, what happened was, I think now looking back, when COVID-19 and the lockdown started, the gatekeepers left the gates and the city gates were just open. And so people suddenly felt like, okay, the rules have gone out the window. The normal rules of how we behave as artists and as buyers and community have stopped for a moment. Only if it was, it might have only been 24 hours, I don't know. But it was sufficient for this, you know, my timing was right, that I put this out there and it just, it was like there was a vacuum. It just got sucked into this vacuum. And suddenly people saying, okay, I want, this is, a, this is a thing I can believe in and this can sustain me. And also let's face it, there was an awful lot of artists out there who were feeling the same way, mm -hmm. thinking, how am I gonna survive? And I, I guess so many of them are thinking, I'll give anything a go. So <laughs> this, this comes up, give it a go. What, what the hell? If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. What can go wrong? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it was clear, I think, because you could see it. You could see on, on the account that people were selling work. So it wasn't, you know, it, there was nothing hidden. There was, it was clearly not a scam because you could see it and, and people knew the people. So if, you know, if, if friends of mine saw me on there selling my work, they'd be going, oh, okay, well, yeah. why did I do that? And I think that the fact that it's, it's, it's not centralized, and I know it's me running it all and managing it all, but ultimately it's not about me. It's about many, many communities that are all interlocked through social media. And all I'm actually doing is kind of developing the culture of it and, the pro and, and maintaining the integrity of that culture. And there's an, I mean, there's an awful lot else I have to do as well, but actually it's not a centralized system. I don't run it. You know, I don't run the account, uh, the um, hashtag. I don't decide what's on it or not on it. I mean, some people think I do, but I don't have any control over that and I don't want any control over that. Um, but what I do is, is I drive the culture of it and I drive the, in, try to maintain the integrity of that so that the system keeps working because it's, it's not based, I mean, what's kind of interesting in this from my perspective is that I base the idea not on a kind of, you know, not on our sort of legal vertical economy, that it's about legal transactions and about a vertical upwards economy. I based it on a kind of horizontal egalitarian economy of people like hunter gatherers now they don't they don't do transactions in the sense that we do them um, they work through customs and through gift cultures it's a much more fluid set of, of uh, kind of relationships so i thought if i if i can create an economy that's a bit like that that rather than being based on sort of clunky slow moving kind of transactions that are done through some kind of system that is managed um, by kind of legal bodies 
then that's going to be too slow. And that's going to be, you know, there's too many people taking a, a bit of the money and it will just take too long for money to transfer across the system. But if you allow every single person in, in that community just to be responsible for their own finances, but all I'm actually doing is showing them how to do it, saying, look, do it like this, uh, and th in this context, with this set of rules and with it, within this ethos, it works and it travels quickly because it, people are just going to replicate it over and over and over again. Do you think it's a bit of a game changer now? Do you think this, um, this continues? Do you think this changes the way that people think about selling art and, and buying art? Is the cat out of the bag? Yeah, I think the cat's definitely out of the bag. <laughs> um, whether, it, whether it will continue at the same rate of increase, I don't know, because no doubt that was driven at the beginning partly by COVID-19. But it is still increasing every day, and I'm deep in the middle of, of building the future of it right now. And by next Tuesday will be the three-month anniversary. And that I'd committed at the beginning to do it for three months. That was my personal commitment. That's in my head. I thought, okay, I'll give three months of my life to this and just go for it. Um, once it all started taking off. I didn't think, I thought I'd be lucky, to be honest, to get to three months. I thought if I can make it to three months, if we can sustain this for three months, that's great. Because if a few people have paid their rent, brilliant. That's, you know, I'd be really happy. But it's clear now that that was, you know, not ambitious enough. Um, and now it's, you know, we're building a, a model that, you know, on Tuesday next week, hopefully all going well, I'll be able to sort of launch stage two, which... Um, well, I'm thinking of it stage four, actually, but it's sort of stage two where we have a kind of more sort of uh, effective management system for it and, um, you know, website, pretty dedicated website for it and all the rest of it. So it should be easier to manage as it is right now, because at the moment it's pretty full on, you know, and I spend, I, I do at least a 12 hour working day, seven days a week and some days you know, an average day actually is about 14 hours. If I can get it to 12, I'm doing quite well. Uh, and it's just, that that's pretty monotonous and it's, you know, it takes its toll. I can't keep doing that. And also I want to get back to making my paintings. I was just going to ask you, how has it affected your, your, your own artwork doing all this? Uh, well, you know, it's funny because I'm making work, I'm, but only kind of drawings at the moment and sort of small paintings on paper because I just don't have the time. But it's keeping me sane doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so... I'm in the studio now, so I have, I've now set up what is now the home of our support pledge, which is my desk with all the IT you could throw at it, because I didn't ever used to have IT in the studio. I didn't even have broadband in the studio on purpose, whereas now I have everything. I have microphones the lot, because I do, you know, I have to do kind of press interviews and podcasts virtually every day, sometimes four or five a day. Wow. So what I'm doing, at the, it's getting less and less, it starts getting manageable. Um, what I do is I, I dip in and out making work. So I'll, I'll work for, you know, 30 minutes and then I might spend, you know, an hour working on, um, you know, writing an interview or, you know, whatever it is. Or, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things to do. It's amazing how much you've got to do to set to keep something like this going. So now we're in as a company, it's kind of a lot of legal stuff we've got to deal with. There's licensing. Um, there's consultants, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've had to upskill massively in the last three months because I, you know, I wasn't an expert on social media. I was just an average user. So, you know, just having consultants and how to do this, how to manage it, um, all the things I need to learn, that's a daily activity, you know. Um, and I've realized that I, I, I've got to learn so quickly doing this that I've just been paying consultants just saying, okay, Zoom meetings every day. How do I do this? How do I do that? Uh, it's quite amusing, some of them, but um, I'm quite enjoying it. I've learned a lot, <laughs> but it's definitely, it's been tough to kind of, you know, I can't, Matt, I can't do what I normally do, which is sort of large scale paintings. I mean, you can see them behind me. Mm. probably. Um, I, it, I don't have the headspace and the bandwidth doing that right now, but I'm working, hopefully once next week's over, I should be in a position where we have the systems in place to manage the rollout of posts the media come and across all social media and and the internet and um the kind of messaging systems because currently i still you know if i go on my my instagram account even or the art support page account it's full with messages 24 hours a day mm -hmm. so i know I've, I've given up trying to answer them all i go through them a few times a day 
kind of timetable it in just to go through, pick on the ones that look like I really need to respond to. And then, you know, the rest, I just have to skim past because I just don't have the time to manage them. So creating systems for managing that. So in effect, I don't have to do it. Somebody else can do it. So that should be up and running next week. And then we're, we're sorting out funding um, at the moment. help stop getting um, donations and accepting donations because at the moment I've been funding everything myself, mm. but obviously I don't want to keep doing that. Um, but like, I, you know, I, I've had to set up a company to do this because otherwise I'm paying tax and everything. Uh, so, you know, just, it's just all that sort of stuff. There's little it's logistics you never even think about, I suppose. No, I mean, it's funny because people think I just came up with a hashtag and that's it. And you think you've no idea. <laughs> it's like a global movement is full time work. <laughs> it's like your life churns upside down within the space of a 24 hours by the sounds of it. It does. You know what's interesting though? I think one of the things that I didn't expect is that because this is so much a part of what I am as an artist, you know, the culture of it and the rest of it, it's actually had a tremendously motivating and inspiring effect on my own work. And although I'm only making these small pieces, my work's gone really well. You'd think, you know, you think the fatigue would, would have, ruined everything but actually it's not it's had the opposite effect i think i found i i can only put it down to the fact that it's it's allowed me to almost it's what it's given me permission to do is just to be wholly myself and to say look this is who i am this is how i think this is what i do like at a lump it i've got a massive audience now who just kind of you know and a lot of people might not like it but it, i don't care you know it's sort of that's it and look you know I suppose in a way what I've been able to prove is if you work this way and if you believe this and you work with these values, look what you can achieve. And it's that, that's as simple as that. It's like lead by example. And my, my, more, my, my ethos is always example, 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 you know, even, if, even with things like, you know, all, all the kind of um, disquiet going on at the moment with issues of equality and the rest of it. I think we, you know, sometimes we need to stand back and just say, actually, we are all complicit in this. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in this society. We are part of the system that's created it. And we're not going to solve inequality by merely talking about it. We actually have to do something. We have to act differently. We have to behave differently. We have to have a different set of values that doesn't just say um, racism is bad, actually, behaves and acts differently that makes racism redundant actually takes it out of the equation and we have those sorts of inequalities because of the type of system we live under and in a way i think if i think the greatest legacy in my mind for what i've done is just to prove that a slight shift in values just turning changing your mind about what success means and what's important can actually change how people behave and I think, I think in a way, I mean, I'm not saying I can solve the world's problems like that, but I think it's a small little change has had a big impact. So whether the impact on that, say on, on the art economy, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've spoken about that with a lot of people in, in the art world. And my personal view is it's not about changing the art economy necessarily because I work in that economy too. I need that economy to, to support large scale ambitious work because it's expensive to make. You can't sell it for 200 pounds. But if our support pledge as a support structure in an economy can work as a sort of parallel economy that un underneath and besides the mainstream art economy, it makes artists sustainable. So, you know, if you've got a show every year, every two years, and you only get paid sporadically for large-scale works or commissions and you need just to be able to support yourself in between exhibitions the rest of it this is a way of supporting yourself it's a way of having regular income where you're not having to have a job which is taking you away from doing what you should be doing which is making art well i think it's bringing people in like i said you've got the you've got the main the main economy and now you've got a whole ba bunch of other people that have been brought in to this to this world, to this world way of thinking, just because of what's happened. It's interesting you were saying earlier about the way that people think about things. I think that, that people have been opening their minds up to a lot of other things in, in, in lockdown. You know, you hear stories about people taking in more of the environment, for example, l looking around their hometowns a little bit more, enjoying their, 
the little things a little bit more because they're there, right? They're more closer to you. They can't think about anything else. They can just think about here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot with this is that when I talk about sustainability, I think sustainability is not like an add on because we want to have a sustainable economy or a sustainable environment related to the environment. Sustainability has to be implicitly in, implicit in everything we do. So the way we do economy, the way we think about the environment, the way we are community, the way we are ourselves, all has to be about sustainability. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It just becomes a pet hobby for a little bit and then we get bored of it. So I think, you know, you can't have, for example, a, in my view, you can't have a relationship to the environment, a productive relationship with protecting the environment under a system that thinks of the environment as merely a resource. You have to think about sustainability across the board. So it might mean that, yes, the wealthy get a bit poorer, but... I don't mind being a bit poorer if everyone's a bit better off. I just think that's a better world to live in. And also it's better for the economy, better for the environment, sorry. And actually, if you look at societies and cultures that have lived in the environments well, that's how they lived. You know, we have not lived in the environment well and we're getting worse, even though for the last 30 or 40 years, we've been talking about environmentalism, but we've got increasingly worse at it. So it's clear that despite our, all our recycling efforts and the rest of it, we are not actually making any difference. We're just making it worse. So I think, you know, things like sustainability has to be a part of everything we do as a culture, as an economy, as artists. And, you know, even, you know, when you go to say the big art fairs, yes, you get wooden spoons these days, but really the whole system is about, a power structure that creates inequality across the board and makes a very small percentage of the population wealthy at the expense of a large percentage of people who have to serve that. And how many artists who are really great, even mid-career artists struggle financially to survive? Why? Yeah. I just don't understand why that should be the case. And I think the thing that I've, has been really exciting for me with art support, but I think the most, you know, the thing that's been kind of, has blown, my, blown me away really is how many of my colleagues and friends who are in that boat, they're, they're really great painters and artists. And they, you know, they're in the art world and they're doing quite well, but they're still struggling. And our support pledge comes along and they're all doing really well. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're, 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 they're getting empowered. They're empowering themselves a bit more. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is there was a bit of a lag because I think for a lot of people in the art world, you know, the art world's based on this idea of kind of uh, uniqueness and kind of the genius. And, um, you know, even hiding the price of work is... You know, because it's, it, it, you know, people say, well, it's vulgar to show the price. Mm. Really? I mean, the art world's the epitome of vulgarity. Yeah. Don't tell me hiding the price is about vulgarity. It's about protecting it, their assets. Mm. So actually, you know, I've had this conversation too with galleries. You know, on our support, you don't hide the price. And if it's sold, we tell everybody. And it's not because that's showing off. It's because it's an effective way of Trans, doing transactions. If the work's for sale, it's for sale. If it's sold, it's sold. Nobody can charge more than 200 pounds. So there's no sense of hierarchy. There are problems with it. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm aware that Instagram works on algorithms and those algorithms favor the popular. And I'm working on that. I've got things in place to sort of try and square that circle. Uh, I mean, some of them are just kind of very simple solutions. Like, I don't know if you've seen on it, I, we've launched this in view where we're asking participants of our support pledge to post under the red tile in view up to seven artists they look at on, on our support pledge. So what that does, it sort of, it uses, if you're say a very popular artist on, our, on Instagram, it pushes the people who come to you across your community mm. without, yeah. uh, without Instagram getting in the way. Exactly. Yeah. So it's just a very simple Bearing solution. Yeah. I mean, I'm working on sort of technical solutions to it as well, but that's sort of uh, for the future. 
Uh, Matthew, it's, it's fantastic. I love the artist spot pledge. I loved it when I first saw it. Still love it now. Um, I've bought some work myself on there. I absolutely think it's a great idea. And I think this whole, um, you know, the ethos is, is just brilliant. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. But thanks for talking to me on Art Online. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart.